Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Gabriel Robinson, to discuss an important piece of black history in South Bend, Indiana. Dr. Gabrielle Robinson has her PhD in drama from the University of London, and she's an award-winning author, including the memoir, Oppie's Berlin Diaries, which is about her grandfather's work as a doctor in Berlin. Uh, in the process, she discovered that he was also a member of the Nazi party and it became uh, an important part of the book that she wrote. We had Dr. Robinson here before to discuss that book, but today we want to talk about another um, important historical event that she has written about, the story of black Studebaker workers in South Bend who overcame racism and discrimination in housing in her book called Better Homes of South Bend. Dr. Robinson was awarded the keys to the city of South Bend, and she was also awarded with the Sagamore of Wabash, which is the highest honor for distinguished contribution to Hoosier heritage. It's interesting that this book, The Better Homes of South Bend, recounts the story of courage and tenacity that was needed to overcome some of the more unseemly Hoosier traditions. So I guess my first question, this is a story that seems to be outside your, your background and what you had usually written about. This is a story about the uh, basically black initiated housing development in South Bend in the 1950s. How did you come to write about something that seemed so removed from what you had been working on before? Yes, I mean, I was really hesitant to write about this, but Leroy Cobb, who was the oldest surviving member of the original Better Homes group, really wanted the story to be told. And he kept after me to say, you know, you've written other books, you can tell this story. Nobody in South Bend knows about it, not even in the African-American community. And he was a gentleman in his 80s now, and he really wanted the story told. And as he talked to me more about it, I was convinced, too, that that is a story that we need to make public and that needs to be known in South Bend and really, in a way, nationwide, because it's a story that could have happened in any other northern industrial city. It, it didn't, but it's interesting that uh, this happens in South Bend. So I, I thought maybe we could start with a description of what were the conditions like in South Bend in 1950. What was it like to live in South Bend in 1950? Right. The, you mentioned the Studebaker workers who'd come from the South. They hadn't expected to, as they said, meet Jim Crow in the North. Because not only were they kept from going to restaurants or uh, hotels, when doctors came to town, they could not stay in any of the hotels. Eventually, the African-American community uh, built a little shopping center, which also had a hotel where they could stay. So it was like a black business district? Yes, I mean, it was a, a black business district that for a while was really thriving. They put up with all of that, including at stores, not being served at stores, not being at Kresge's counter, not serving them, and all these things. What really, really bothered them, though, was the housing segregation, because they were relegated to live in a slum right near the factories. Near the, Studebaker, near, near the Olivet yes. factory, yes. And uh, railroad crosses and all the bars that are involved with that. It was a terrible place to raise children. And that had really been their main motivation to come, to find a better place to raise their families. So they got together and they talked, we need to find a way, but they didn't know how because they had seen Dr. Wagner, for example, an old gentleman with whom I talked a lot, who would tell me that when he came to town, his wife, who also was a teacher and had a master's degree and was very educated, called a bank who had a house that just seemed right for them. And she had a great conversation with the banker and said, yeah, this sounds really good. Let's make an appointment to come to the bank. And when they showed up at the bank, the banker had the gall to just tell them straight in their face, that house is not available to you. And they didn't get a house. And Dr. Chambly, another doctor, had the same problem. Um, he went to Cressy and Everett, our, one of our major realtors, and couldn't even see a realtor. The receptionist told him there was nothing there for him. And uh, so they knew they were up against huge odds and huge obstacles. 
So th this is what they're facing. I mean, a, a longer history puts you back where the Klan is attacking the, the churches and destroying the churches. There's no way you can go to the YMCA or to, or to restaurants or hotels. Uh, but when we're talking 1950, and the several thousand black workers are working at Studebaker, so they have a stable income, a good income. I yes. understand Studebaker was one of the better uh, auto companies to work for in the North until they It was the only one that was unionized. That made the difference. Because Oliver Plow, a, another worldwide company, did not hire any African Americans. Although they desperately needed workers, I mean, it's a terrible situation. So we're talking 1950, and there's no place to live. There's segregation. Um, how 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 did they um, kind of move forward? There's a chapter in your book. Uh, I think it's the fourth chapter. It says you title it "Stronger Than Legislation: Jim Crow in South Bend," um, especially when we talk about employment and housing. So. It's, it's strange to think that, that the laws don't seem to work because there are practices, everyday practices, that somehow maintains discrimination, whether that's Cressy and Everett or whether it's the bank. Uh, how, how, could, how does Jim Crow get implemented or maintained without a legal structure? Uh, before that, just quickly, I mentioned, I hadn't intended to mention Cressy and Everett, but they had invited me, once the book has come out, they had, have invited me to talk to their realtors and so on. <laughs> they clearly, you know, felt well, bad, but it was, you know, the documented that it yeah, what happened. Yeah, yeah. It's um, one of the things, I mean, I, I just want to interject, it's one of the things often where they, I mean, there's a discussion publicly about critical race theory, which I just think is history. But part of it is people don't necessarily want to know what was or what happened, and they certainly don't want to make connections about was, what was and what is yes. with the same uh, kinds of practices, which is really what leads me to this question. You don't have any legal barriers yeah. to housing or employment, but there's certain practices that somehow are implemented and maintained. So yeah. how does that... Perhaps I can give you an example from the FHA. You know, the only reason, as you know, for the FHA's existence was to help lower income people to get mortgages by underwriting them for the banks. So the FHA in the 40s had their official manual or code of ethics which says, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. And then they argued, therefore, protective covenants are essential for uh, what they then call harmonious and well-developed neighborhoods. And a protective covenant means that the deed says you can't sell to... No blacks, no Chinese, um, often no Jews as well. And so that was their document in the 40s. In 1950, under pressure in part from the NAACP, they moderated their language a bit, so that would mean, you know, legally it wasn't quite the same, but they did not they in did the not least change, the practice. change their practice. For example, black realtors could not call themselves realtors, they had to call themselves realtists, because <laughs> only, only whites were realtors. Yeah, yeah. And it really did not change anything. The banks just did not give mortgages to African Americans. So um, the, the story is about the Better Homes of South Bend. What, what prompted or what opportunity existed that, uh, I don't know, a dozen families or so came together and said, we need to form this organization, this nonprofit group, and we're going to buy houses. And what, what, what transpired that led them to come up with this idea that this may be a way to resolve this question of discrimination in housing. Yeah, I just talked to your producer, Alicia, and she talked about all the no's that she confronted in growing up. And that's exactly what it was with them. There were no's everywhere, but they refused to take them. They kept on talking, and they kept seeing that they needed help. And I think that was one crucial step. And they were very lucky to get J. Chester Allen, a black attorney, who was a lifelong fighter for social justice to come and help them. In fact, you mentioned the uh, segregation that goes back you know, decades and decades. He came in the 1930s 
And one of his first initiatives then was in the early 30s was to desegregate the South Bend Natatorium, which was hailed as one of the most beautiful indoor swimming pools in the state of Indiana. It took him a full 19 years to achieve that. But he stuck with it. He kept organizing. He kept reaching out. He kept talking to people and eventually succeeded. So I thought of it that he had two advantages. One, that he was such a strong fighter. The other, that he was used to setbacks and to no's and yet kept going. And that's what he told them. And the first thing he told them, we have to organize. We cannot do it individually. So we, it became a cooperative? Yes. I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just a group of people that get together, we want to buy a bunch right. of houses, but they actually they, formed an organization that was, I guess, became a nonprofit, so they were incorporated. Yes. And it was a cooperative from the very beginning. Yes, so. South Bend Inc. And it, I say, like to think, and I have not come up with an earlier one, that it was one of maybe the first such African-American co-op in the state of Indiana. And it was a co-op specifically for housing. Mm -hmm. So their, their, their plan was, I mean, there weren't houses they were going to buy. What, how did this... I mean, I'm giving away the book now, but no, no. They, they, they aren't buying 40 <laughs> houses. They're, they're buying vacant land. How did that, how did, I mean, how were they even able to buy the land? Yes, and that actually is a question I have not solved because it, the land belonged to the county. And they worked as a co-op, and somehow it snuck in. The county was very disorganized at the time. I saw some of their records; they were on scripts. So of one of paper, the secretaries, one of the secretaries, just <laughs> missed. I assume. I don't know. But what struck me about that, to begin with, was the absolute enforcement on the Better Homes Group on secrecy. Even in their minutes, they never mentioned the place where they, which they wanted to buy, and they call it a beautiful spot for living but they don't say anything else about it because they knew as soon as word would get out, they would be foiled. So, so they, they found this land, I assume it was in an undeveloped part of the city, but it was near a white neighborhood that already had houses, is that correct? Yes, I mean, um, the, it was in the 1700 block of North Elmer Street. Up to the 1600 block, it was very, uh, heavily uh, built up, and there were usually workers from Poland and Hungary and Germany who had little houses there. But from the 1700 block on, there was very little. There were maybe six or seven houses, but all white. So they purchased a whole number of lots at the same time. Lots. They, yeah, so they didn't buy them one at a time. No. So once that, once the approval for buying those 26 lots was done, they were in essentially in a legal position to own those lots. Yes. Um, one of the women that you quote in the book says buying the lots was easy. Building the homes was more difficult because they had to get a sewer built because there was no sewer. They had to have water lines built and the city was requiring all those things to be done first. They had to have an architect and they had difficulty getting the architect. Then they had to have, I, I guess, loans to get the property built and all of this just took, it was an ordeal. It took time and, and some of them got frustrated. And absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, because they also always had to pay, you know, for assessment and for, you know, the, the lots and so on. They had to pay money, yet they did not see any progress towards getting yeah. their houses. And the amazing thing is that out of the 26 families who were originally part of it, only four dropped out. Many were frustrated and many doubted they'd ever get their houses, but they stuck together. And that was in part that excellent organization they had, you know, from the president, the vice president, the treasurer, the secretary, and particularly the board of directors, whose main role, as I can see from their minutes, was to A, get the money from them, <laughs> and B, to encourage them to stick with it. And um, well, I think- Well, there were some high points. Um, I don't remember the name of the builder, but the, the builder that they finally uh, decided on, was he from, were they from Michigan? Is that uh, yeah, from, from Niles. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, and they seemed to be fairly cooperative and supportive and would, would, would work, which 
they couldn't get somebody closer to home. Took but, a long time, yeah. yes. But once they had that, that must have given them some hope and encouragement too. Was right, but they still couldn't get those loans. The banks just said no. Even once they got that guy from the FHA, the um, racial advisor that the yeah. FHA, again under pressure from the NAACP, um, had provided. In fact, I had a, uh, have a very nice exchange with uh, Richard Rothstein of the Color of Law about this because I asked him, I said, you don't say anything about that. And he said he was aware, but he was very interested. And he actually asked for my book so yeah. that he could see what the effect was locally. And even though he fought on their side, it took so many visits, so much coercion, till at some point, I think the guy just really gave them an ultimatum. Either you give them, check their credit. If their credit is good, give them the mortgage, or the FHA will not underwrite any of your mortgages. And eventually they caved in, but we're talking years here. Eventually, they do get the homes built, mm -hmm. and they move in. The, the families that are there, and uh, uh, towards the end of the book, there's wonderful pictures of people at picnics and kids playing, and you know they're dressed right. up in their Sunday best, and, and it, it's kind of like a uh, an island of joy among the white residents. So, uh, I, I guess we could uh, say that this was a success because the Better Homes of South Bend happened, they got the lots. It's, not a, it's not a completely black community. It's not like it's segregated because mm -hmm. there's still white families there, but it's a fairly uh, stable community. And these people have known each other for years and they've got a, a sense of cooperation and community even going in. So it must have been a, uh, you even mentioned some of the people that talk about their childhood and how, how grateful they were to have lived yes, in, the, yes. in that community. And that was another surprise for me. What a vibrant community they created. And I don't know whether people can see, the picture shows the houses and the picnic, the celebratory picnic four <laughs> years later that they, that they did. And amazingly, 50% of the children of Better Homes went to college, although many of their parents weren't even able to finish high school. I mean, it's just a huge success. They became teachers and um, school principals, even a professor and doctors. I mean, just amazing success in that group because they were such a cohesive group. As one of them told me, on Elmer Street, I had many dads because they were all looking after each other and looking out for each other. Were those, one of the things you mentioned is they're Studebaker workers. So were most of the people that bought the homes Studebaker workers to start with? So they, they also had years of working together and being in the same union and being at the same workplace. They probably had built a camaraderie and some understanding of each other. So Absolutely. that carries over into the community because it started in their, in their daily work yes. life, so. Yes, yeah. and when we mentioned Studebaker, yes, they did get jobs, but they couldn't get jobs anywhere else, but they got the worst job. They worked, all worked in the foundry, you know, which was hot and dangerous and dirty and, you know, just the place nobody wanted to work. So they did employ them and they did pay well because they were unionized, but they had the roughest job of all. So, uh, it's a it's a small book. It goes very quickly from uh, the conditions that they face in the, the the mid 20th century in South Bend, racism, discrimination, the success of doing the Better Homes of South Bend. You end up with a vibrant community where people are succeeding and moving on. Um, so. I think it was 1963, Studebaker closed, so 7,000 people lose their jobs. Does this have an impact on the community? Well, Because like I think of Gary, Indiana now, when U.S. Steel went from 37,000 employees to 8,000, you're losing lots of people, and you yes. can kind of tell what happened to the, the community and the upkeep just because you no longer have a viable income. So did that have that same kind of impact on these um, uh, this community. I mean, it was a devastating impact that South Bend is still recovering <laughs> yeah. from, right? I mean, they're still trying to find their identity yeah. in the post-industrial world. But again, amazingly, 
every one of the Better Homes people got a job. They all managed, many of them became caretakers, often in schools or in other uh, big buildings, but they were not homeless or jobless. Because again, they had learned how to deal with people and how to deal with uh, institutions. And I, I would assume they also had the, the collective spirit or the cooperative spirit. So you are looking for a job and maybe your neighbor right. found one, which gives you hope, and you're also getting encouragement from the neighbor as well. So it seems that whole collective spirit I think so. probably had some, uh, as opposed to being an isolated individual that uh, has to deal with their own problems and their own family problems. But you're looking at it as a the Better Homes community, right? I think I mean, that's a very good point, yeah. And for instance, Leroy Cobb, the gentleman who approached me, he worked in the post office, which was a great job, and worked his way up from washing cars to becoming a supervisor. So uh, they managed to navigate this difficult situation, but most of South Bend did not. So this should be uh, an inspiring story. And you might think, uh, so some people argue that racism is in the past, the race difference is gone. But when I think of South Bend, I not only think of what you talked about, uh, in Fremont Park in 2012, 2013, police uh, sh shot some young men and they, there was no consequence. And I think recently, um, Eric Logan was shot by a police officer and just last year, I believe, a federal judge said that it was a justified shooting. So um, I, I don't mean to bring us down back from this success, but the conditions have not been totally resolved. The Jim Crow in the North is kind of uh, on one level remains, so. Absolutely, and you know, when I wrote it, I thought of it as a story arc, as a success story. But then I realized that it was a success, but the final victory had not been won in by any means. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a battle that's been won. I, I, I wonder if another success might be um, how they did this. That we that you and you reflect on that in a few places. I wish I would have uh, marked them in the book. I could quote them for you. But it, w one of the places you point out that they were united, that they were determined, that nobody seemed to give up, and that they cooperated. And those seems to be three ingredients for anything. Whether you're talking about Ferguson, Missouri, or Laquan McDonald in Chicago, or any any condition. That if you're united, that if you're determined, and if you have a, a cooperative among a collectivity, there is, there is going to be some more, more likely a positive outcome. Oh, absolutely. That, I'm glad you uh, bring that up because I think that is one of the lessons for us from the book, that if you want to have social change, you need to have courage, you need to have perseverance. And I like the uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois quote, intelligent cooperation. And that's exactly what they had. Yeah, I think that that was a phrase that you put in the book, intelligent cooperation. I loved it. <laughs> I mean, uh, Du Bois called for that in 1933, saying, unless we work together in intelligent cooperation, we'll be left out again as mere beggars. He called for it then, and the Better Homes sort of uh, represented that. You mentioned uh, Richard Rothstein before, and there was some... Uh, he, I, apparently he wrote a book. There were some other things that you might recommend for our viewers. Um, yes, I thought uh, we could mention that book, for example, as one of the major ones for housing. It's called Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law. The Color of Law, okay. And he argues and shows in great detail all across the country what he actually does call de jure, meaning by the law, segregation on the federal, on the state, and the local level. And he says, he sees it as a systematic violation of black Americans' constitutional rights. And I would like just to, and I think maybe that will be put up to, two quotes of his which sort of sure. embody sure. that. He says, the public policies of yesterday still shape the racial landscape of today. So what happened in South Bend in 1950 continues to shape the conditions of right. real estate and employment today. Okay. And he says then, by failing to recognize that we now live with the severe enduring effects 
of de jure segregation, we avoid confronting our constitutional obligation to reverse. Well, we could talk more about both the book and, and uh, the current conditions that we face, but that's all the time we have on our program today. So I want to thank Dr. Gabriel Robinson for joining me today on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. I'll see you next time. <laughs>